Nobody identified Johnny DiCapier at the scene, um, at the subway platform where the mugging and the killing took place. Uh, nobody, in, in fact, uh, several of the defendants specifically excluded Johnny DiCapier as somebody who was present during that, that terrible encounter. Um, the evidence against Johnny DiCapier consisted of a member of the Watkins family saying that he looked vaguely familiar a formulation she had used no fewer than 27 times with various defendants at various times. And of course, Johnny Hincapier's own confession, which was elicited through brutality, through intimidation. The confession was coerced, and the confession was false. Uh, we know that because of the dogged uh, work of uh, Professor Hughes and Bob Dennison, who will get to them in just a moment. Um, but there was an eighth person who was charged with that crime, a man by the name of Luis Montero. And Luis Montero was subjected to the same brutality as Johnny Hincapier. And Luis Montero was on the cusp of confessing himself to a crime he did not commit. And when he was ready to finally confess, he was told, sorry, you don't uh, have the opportunity to confess now because the prosecutor has left for the night. And he was returned to a holding cell, but he was charged with the murder and held for a year and a half. Uh, same allegation, he looked vaguely similar, looked vaguely familiar. Ultimately, there was an investigation, and a year and a half later, Luis Montero was exonerated, the charges against him dismissed, and after a year and a half being falsely accused of one of the most horrendous killings in New York, um, he, he quietly and calmly left the country. Uh, due to the investigative efforts of Bob Dennison and uh, Bill Hughes, uh, they were able to track down Luis Montero. And Mr. Montero now, uh, who's on the cusp of becoming an American citizen, has given us an affidavit, and that affidavit does two things. One, it describes the brutality that was inflicted on Montero, that resulted in Montero almost giving a confession to a crime that we know he did not commit. Um, this corroborates Johnny Hincapier's account of what had happened to him and is powerful evidence um, against the prosecutor's account that the police all acted with due probity and rectitude. Uh, the second thing that Montero's uh, uh, affidavit does is Montero was in the subway system that night but he was not down on the subway platform. He was in the token booth area. And he was actually with Johnny Hincapier when the actual mugging and stabbing took place on the subway platform below. Johnny was never outside of Montero's sight during the time of the mugging and during the time of the stabbing. And Montero can affirmatively state that because of that, there is no way that Johnny Hincapier was involved this killing. Now, now, this new evidence is corroborated by old evidence. One of the original defendants, Ricardo Lopez, himself said there were only six of us, and he confessed to his own role, he named the others, he did not name Johnny Hincapier, nor did he name Luis Montero, who ultimately was also charged. Anthony Anderson, one of the defendants uh, who acknowledges his own role in the killing, has come forward and issued an affidavit saying, yes, um, Johnny Hincapier was not one of us, not one of the six who planned the mugging, carried out the mugging, and carried out the killing. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> me, the other defendants have either uh, refused to come forward or have said they don't remember who was involved, but none of the original defendants uh, claim that, that Johnny Hincapier played any role whatsoever in this case. He probably would have been acquitted the first time had the trial judge allowed Ricardo Lopez's confession into evidence. The confession page where he says it was just six of us. That, that evidence was excluded uh, uh, from court. So for all of these reasons, we, we've come into court now. It's been a very, very long road for Johnny, a very long road for the Hincapier family. And really, the only reason we're here, uh, Ms. Busby and I, who are very proud to be representing Johnny, on another one of these, these terrible false confession, wrongful conviction cases, the only reason we're here is due to the work of Bob Dennison and Bill Hughes, and I, I'd like them to come forward and speak with you and talk about the investigative efforts that led to this filing. Uh, Bob? Okay. Huh? Uh, 
Bob and I both uh, met Johnny when he's uh, incarcerated in prison. Um, it's a true story, and both police that he uh, told to, but he had nothing to do with the crime. So, so this uh, Bobby Casey was born in Jerusalem, Ontario, where we part of the crime. Uh, and he sat down, and we, without any prompting you know, or coaching, we just asked him what happened that night. And he just took out a napkin and drew a map of where he was, where his happy was. decided to do was we've had un unfortunately we've had prior experience with the district attorney's conviction integrity unit and it's been my unhappy experience that that particular unit that we investigate these cases is more interested in re-justifying the cases than they than they are in actually um, a, a, a sincere independent investigation so we have not presented mr montero to them i will say this the DA's office uh, reinvestigated this case on its own several years ago, but used the same prosecutor, Mr. Shields, uh, who originally prosecuted uh, in Kathy A. And to the surprise of absolutely no one, in violation of all best practices, they concluded that Johnny had been rightfully convicted. But they did not know about, well, they, they, they knew Luis Montero was there because they had charged him with second degree murder growing up. But they had not spoken to Montero about uh, what had taken place. How well did uh, Mr. Montero know Mr. Montero? Mm -hmm. He knew Johnny slightly. He knew him. He met him a few times before. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the whole large. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. He was with him the day of the, the incident, too. Right. You know, the, the, the whole group of, of young people that were going out dancing at the Rosalind Ballroom, there were like 60 or 70 in the whole group. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I think probably all of them knew somebody who knew somebody, but only six of them were actually involved in the, in the, uh, the Muddy Clock robbery. Which cops were involved in this coerced confession, and what exactly did they do? Yeah. Detective Ronald Casey. And specifically to Johnny, Johnny states that Detective Casey um, told him what the story was that he could memorize. So smoke in his face, used physical abuse, shoved him, pulled his hair, screamed at him, and told him exactly what to memorize. And then another detective was called in, and the story was written down. How long was he in there with them before? Um, I'm not sure of the exact amount of time he was in Detective there. Casey been involved in any other suspicious cases? Mm -hmm. 
Is this the first uh, appeal of the, of the conviction? No, the conviction was originally appealed uh, when Johnny was convicted. The conviction was affirmed. Um, you know, the major basis for appeal was the Ricardo Lopez tape should have come into evidence <coughs> because that exonerated Johnny, and the court held that, well, it was inculpatory. It was a declaration against penal interest as to Ricardo Lopez. When Ricardo said, yeah, I was involved in the mugging, but it was not a declaration against penal interest when he said um, there were only six of us and here they are. So uh, Judge Torres, actually, who's retired, did not allow that into evidence. So this is like the first 440 or the first This is the first 440, uh, the first time we've come forward with this evidence. And, and again, it's evidence that, that Bill and Bob have been working on, you know, for quite some period of time. Has anyone been in touch with the premier group in touch with the Watkins family about this? I, uh, I interviewed the Watkins family uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, since Mr. Watkins has since uh, passed away, and uh, the the Watkins family position is that uh, well, the, those boys all confessed, and I said to them, "Do you have it? You know, can you possibly conceive the fact that people do confess falsely to crimes? Well, we have mounting evidence, uh, you know, to back that up, and they weren't too open to that suggestion." I mean, look, I, I think we've all, all of us on this side and many of us in the press corps have been around these cases in New York for long enough to know that there are a number of wrongful conviction, bad confession cases that came out of overzealous law enforcement uh, during the crack epidemic in the 1980s and early 1990s. There were three times the number of murders, half the number of cops, and if mistakes were going to be made, uh, the cops were going to err on the side of sweeping up too many people rather than sweeping up too few. And I think we've finally gotten to the point in our city's history where we can begin to look back on this as history and, and begin to rectify some of the injustices that were done in the name of law and order a generation ago. If you're right, he's innocent. How long has he been in jail? How old is he now? Where is he? 41 now. He's been in since he was 18. He's, of course, you know, he's a model inmate. Uh, he participates extensively with a, a prisoner's arts and theatrical group. Uh, some Brent, of... Brent. Yeah. Brent taught him, right? right? Yeah, taught him since 2003, and he's a great guy. He's really such a positive guy. I mean, a lot of guys, you know, you know Johnny was, you know, is falsely convicted, according to how we strongly feel, and he's not bitter. He's just... just very positive, very special guy. I've spoken to a lot of inmates who know him, and, you know, he's, he really helps a lot of inmates in prison. He's just, uh, you know, and as Ron brought out, the city, in the headlines of the Post, I think you brought it out too, but there's a, the way they, they rounded up these guys so quickly, because the headlines read, Dave, do something, because you know, after the Bryant's Watkins murder, the city was, you know, a little bit crazy, and they just rushed to grab whoever they could. And the Watkins murder, uh, just for <coughs> historical context, occurred uh, two weeks after the, the first set of convictions in the Central Park uh, Five case, and there were some detectives involved in that case questioned the suspects in the, in the Watkins case. But I, I, uh, I don't know Gonzalez? Gonzalez. 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 Who's currently, I think, I think he's one of the current defendants in the Central Park Jogger case. Well, that's the other case that comes to mind, right. because uh, th those were coerced confessions as well. It's a similar, like, wolf pack thing, right? We used to talk about wolf packs back then. Right. I mean, the, these are the sort of two cases that, that in many ways, um, bookended the, the, the difficulties and tragedies of the criminal justice system and public safety. Um, all of those convicted in the Central Park Jogger case were confessed. All of them confessed. All of them were convicted. All of them were completely innocent. Um, here, we're, we're, there were a number of confessions that were made by defendants, and, and those defendants are not challenging their guilt. It's not as though every confession that was ever given um, was a false confession, um, but, but there's a substantial number of confessions that were given that were coerced. And some of those coerced confessions were true, and some of those coerced confessions were false. And in uh, New and York think, State, is it, I'm sorry. sorry, no, go ahead. Lauren. In New York State, 50% of the wrongful convictions that have been overturned involve a false confession. Nationally, it's 25%. 
and approximately 50% of all murder wrongful convictions nationally involve a false confession. I, I think those of us who were around during that time in the 80s and 90s uh, know that the police regularly use improper and coercive <laughs> techniques to uh, extract confessions. Prosecutors regularly uh, had those officers deny their misconduct, and judges regularly uh, acted as though they believed the police officers, even though we all knew what was going on. In many of those cases, the defendants confessed truthfully, although under coercion. But when you're coercing confessions, you get a lot of false confessions. Does anybody from the family want to say anything about this? Please. Alex. 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 This is Johnny's brother, Alex. How you doing? Johnny's father. I just Johnny's want to mother. Please don't talk. Just go forward. We're just all very happy that the truth is finally coming out, and a lot of people, it's been a struggle with the help of Bob, Bill, Ron, Leah, and everybody, and just everybody who's been supporting us. I just want to say thank you very much. It's great to be here today, thanks to, the, to Mr. Kubi, thanks to Bob Thanks, to my views and all the friends that have been around us. It's great to be here, hoping that this uh, new step is going to finally be the, the, the freedom of Yanni. Tell us a little bit about what he was like as an 18-year-old, what was going on <coughs> in his life at the time. Oh, um, was it right, Jim? Full of joy, love for his family. Uh, it has been... Uh, not only when he grew up, but also now, all these 23 years, he has never changed. He has been the same Charlie, full of uh, great hopes and full of love for all human beings and uh, for his parents, for his family. He has been supporting us from prison, uh, helping us to uh, keep living, keep believing. Especially, you know, I am so proud of being his mother. He has never let us down. He's been a great, great man. He has been participated in every educational program. And he has, he just got a master about two years ago. Now he's looking for his uh, doctor's degree. He is a model. He's, uh, I mean, people that know him, they, 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 they love him. Okay. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Ron Kubi, Mr. Ron Kubi, Leah. Right Bob behind Bain. you. <laughs> you knew somebody was behind you. Leah yeah, and uh, Mark Tennyson, Bill, Where and all our wonderful friends. All the people from the RTA, which I love. And uh, God bless America. God bless America. Because I came to this country believing that this is the greatest place. on all of you, and I hope that this story will be read, so nobody will go through what we have been going through, and this will never happen again to no one. Thank you. 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 In these 23 years for the Watkins family, they have been in our heart every single day, every Christmas, every holidays, every day actually, because as a mother, I, I, I am close to her. Thank you. Where are you all?